Wales and uh, the CIOB. So our last event, Collaboration is Key, was, was a great success, and that recording is, is now available through our, our YouTube channel, which you can check out. Um, this session uh, will be recorded as well. So if you do want to watch this again, uh, Vicky and the team at the CIOB will, will send up a thank you email after the event with the link to the recording uh, for you to, to share as well. Just to check that everybody can uh, can hear me and see my screen, there's uh, there's a chat option, which I'm sure everyone is really used to now in, in Teams. So let, let's just, um, I'll ask you just to type in the name of the company or whatever you're based, first of all, just to ensure that you can hear me okay. So if you just put that in the chat log for now, that would be great. We'll see those through and um, perfect. And familiar names as well, which is fantastic. Great. So today's session uh, is titled Delivering Digital Value, Design Construct with a Focus on Operation and Maintenance. So I'm pleased to be joined by uh, quite an interesting lineup today. So we've got Gavin Trailer, uh, Mike Ford uh, and Gerald with us as well. So the agenda today is as follows. So uh, for those who, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rhys Lewis. I'm the director at a company called Robusto, and I'm uh, the chair for the UK BIM Alliance Wales. So pleased to, to bring this event to you. Gavin Trailer joins us. Well, actually, you, you can introduce yourself better than I can, Gavin. Uh, do you want to say hello? Hello. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And who you are and what you do as well, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover that in my uh, in my notes, Reese. But um, yeah, I'm a lecturer um, at uh, Trinity St. David's down in Swansea. Perfect. And you may recognise Gavin, who... Uh, hijacked our own round table in the last um, session. So good to have you getting involved today, Gavin. And um, yeah, also pleased to have Mike Ford uh, to join us uh, as well. Mike, maybe you can say a bit more than hello as well. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Hi, <Jess>. uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my name is Mike Ford. I'm a digital engineering group manager at Ridge and Partners LLP. And I've recently joined the company and I was at the University of the West of England beforehand. Uh, which is why I'm talking more about the um, operate and maintain uh, side of, of the presentation today. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks Mike. And uh, Gerald can hear us loud and clear as well. Gerald will, will be uh, will be chairing the, the round table after we've had the, the presentation. So, hey, Gerald. Hi, Aris. Um Yeah, my name is Gerald Naylor. Um, I'm the former director of the Construction Wales Innovation Centre, and one of the supporters of this uh, event today. And I'm the current chair of the CIOB in Wales. Perfect. Thanks, Gerald. So just, just a few things before we get started. So yeah, kindly ask you just to mute your mics just in the benefit of sharing this recording with others. Um, if you're not speaking, but yeah, we'll ask you to switch those on later on uh, if there are any questions. If there are, questions through the presentations, just ask them in the chat log and myself or the team will do our best to answer those as we go through. Um, if we don't get to them, we'll use them as part of our own table. Sessions recorded and uh, we, we, we'd really appreciate if you could share this event on your social media uh, platform of choice. I tend to use Twitter quite uh, quite a bit and we'll be using the hashtag digital value for anything I share uh, in today's event and again thank you for for joining us so without further ado i'll i'll hand over to our first speaker gavin trailer we'll say more than hello gavin i'll stop <laughs> sharing my screen now and uh i'll hand over to yourself okay i'll just get my screen right there we go. can uh, everyone see that yep yep all good yep. right well i will i will say a little bit more than hello um so good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Gavin Trailer, and uh, I have many hats, and I have had many hats. Um, I'm currently a lecturer in uh, architecture and construction at Trinity St. David's. So I teach at the School of Architecture, Construction and Environment. Um, but I've also worked um, within the public sector, uh, leading the in-house uh, design and construction management team for Cardiff Council. And I can see a few familiar names on the chat this morning from that as well. Um, so I'm a chartered architect as well. So uh, I guess from a, a BIM point of view, I've got a you know the consultant side. Um, I'm part of a client team. Uh, and now I'm lecturing as part of a large organization as well and trying to impact some of that experience, some of that knowledge onto the, the kind of the next uh, generation. 
Uh, and I'm also president-elect for the Royal Society of Architects in Wales. I always forget to say that, but yeah, I will be RCW president uh, come September. Uh, so what I was going to do today is just give you a little brief intro into how we kind of teach the digital journey, I guess, at, at the university, and then just jump into um, some of the research that I've been doing with some of the master's students there talking about new and existing buildings in terms of, of building information modeling. So just a snapshot there, we've got some kind of foundation level uh, where we have some involvement with AutoCAD and Revit, and then we look at kind of first year, second year, third year in the degree programs where we got the use of digital technologies coming through. So that's just the kind of the theme of it. Um, and then at a master's level at that kind of postgraduate level, we've got uh, a module called construction technology and building information modeling. So it's looking at um, new and old buildings and the implications. Uh, and that's why I want to touch on uh, some of those things. Now, I say digital journey, but um, this is to all the programs that we teach there as well. So it's not just the architecture, it's uh, construction project management. It's also the quantity surveyors, um, building surveyors, uh, civil engineers and architectural technologists. So we've got um, a range of, uh, of study in there at uh, undergrad and postgrad level. So whenever I teach any of the students or talk to any of the students, I always say this, no matter what level it is, why do we draw? OK, um, and this is always the first slide I present them with the cave paintings in Argentina, just to say that a picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah, it's all about communication. It's how we get that message across um, and to get the students to understand that, you know, drawing is a form of language. Um, and if we do it, um, present that in a certain way, we can understand that message which is being communicated through to us. So it's just a range of images there. I normally lecture on this for four hour slots, but I have promised I will do this in 15 minutes. OK, so it's a little bit of a snapshot today. But what we also talk to the students about is that accelerating uh, rate of change, I guess, with the, the digital technologies. Um, and you'll have a copy of my slides as well uh, sent through so you can go back and have a look at some of these. But, you know, we've got this this curve going off the scale, really, in terms of how digital technologies are changing and how we embed that into the kind of the learning at the university. But what I try and get over to uh, the students when we talk about BIM or building information modeling, what we're actually talking about is better information management. So before we start thinking of jumping in the 3D models and all that, start thinking about the the information management. Now, I, I'll credit this to Dan, Dan Rossiter, who used to be a colleague of mine at, uh, at Cardiff Council, uh, and he's now Digital uh, Transformation Officer at, uh, at the BSI. Um, and he came up with that, and I, I thought, that's a really catchy thing to say, really. You know, it's talk about the information. Let's not talk about, forget the modeling, information. So we kind of explained to the students, well, well, why BIM? You know, why do we do this? You know. And this is the example I give them. This is a lovely linear project. OK, so we've got a project. It starts a concept stage and we go all the way through the stages to handover. In reality, that's what happens. You know, we've got things happening left, right and center. You may have more than one client. You may have consultants talking to one another and how that information and think of it as information is shared and used through the duration of the project can be a bit scattered again. Yeah. So what we need to do is start thinking about how we can coordinate that information. So things like this don't happen. And yes, this is a photoshopped image and many of you would have seen it. And there's a million of these on the Internet, but we don't want this kind of thing to happen. OK, we want a coordinated approach for BIM. So I try in, in all the, the lectures to talk about information modeling and information management, but not just for the design and not just for the construction phase, but throughout the life cycle of a building. And why is that? Well, from a design and construct perspective, BIM, you know, we can we can manage a project, we can work in a more coordinated way. It's an excellent option for a, for a consultant or a contractor to to deliver. But from a client perspective, we're talking about assets, we're not talking about projects. So what we need to do is find the true value of BIM. And that the true value to me in terms of BIM is the operate and maintain. 
And that's why clients uh, are key to kind of unlocking that potential. So what I want to do is just spend a few minutes jumping into some of the research um, that I've been doing with some of the master's students at the university. As I said, this is looking at new and existing buildings. So I'll just start with the kind of the new buildings. And what, what we strip the kind of the, the BIM process down to is thinking about a building as designed, thinking about a building as constructed, and thinking about how we manage that. Now, what we need to do in terms of design, construct, operate, and maintain is that one truth information. So we want that continuous thread going through the, the project, which essentially helps the asset through its life cycle. Now, the challenge is when we look at BIM documentation, I've tried to keep this simple today, so I'm not going to try desperately not to mention too many acronyms. But this is a, is a wonderful process diagram from the ISO standards. Um, and the three things that I'm talking about there um, are, are as kind of designed, which is our project information model, our asset information model, which is our kind of as constructed and then maintained then and through trigger events, okay? So what I've challenged the master's students to is to look at, say, a new build project and think, well, are these things the same? Because if a client hasn't asked for how they want to manage a built-in, how do we know then that the information we've got through a, a BIM project is what we actually need? So that was one of the one of the key things, those kind of learning outcomes. So what we actually were talking about is when we look at these things, are they the same? In reality, they're not. You know, in many cases. You will have an as designed, which is which is passed on to the client at a later stage, with a section of O and M manuals, health and safety files, two D data as built, and maybe Kobe. Okay, I'm not going to go into Kobe, but essentially spreadsheet data. Okay, now that information may be there from the contractor, uh, it may be provided by uh, the contractor as part of the process, but inevitably it sits on the disk or the USB stick. Um, and we're, we're all familiar, I'm sure, with, with that scenario. What tends to happen is, well, our building's new, nothing's going to go wrong with it, and then we'll manage it as required in the future when, when, when we need to. Okay, so that's not really unlocking that true potential of BIM here, because what we're doing is we're, we're isolating it. We're creating a separate project after the, after the main event. So we're not really thinking about the life cycle of the asset. So what I challenge the students to look at is, well, well, how do we evaluate that we've got the information that we've, you know, what, what have we got? What are we dealing with? So if we have a BIM project given over to us, how could we go back and check that we've, we've got what we need to manage this building in the future? So we could go out and we could speak to people in the building and do a post-occupancy evaluation. We can measure it. We can do thermal imaging, drone surveys, point cloud data. We can go out and physically take a, a tape measure and measure that everything is correct, or we could trawl through the stack of O&M manuals. If we're lucky, we've got a collaborative digital tool. Not always the case. But then we've got to think about, well, how do we manage these buildings going forward? You know, that we've, we've got a, um, an asset here. How, how do we manage this? What are the kind of things that we need to think about to the, through the life cycle? So we're not thinking project now. We're way beyond that. You know, how do we manage this? How do we look at improving it for sustainability? How do we monitor energy? How do we look at our statutory OBS? What are we looking for in terms of health and safety? And then if we want to put an extension, adaptations, or introduce new technologies. As I said, that curve is going way beyond us at a, at a rapid rate. So technology is changing. Now, when we manage facilities, and many of you may be familiar with this, we've got the kind of reactive maintenance where things go wrong, we need to do something about it. We may have a, an Excel spreadsheet to the back background as our computer-aided facilities management. We may have a system online, a cloud system, where we put data in and we get data out. We may have our, you know, our preventative maintenance, a cyclical testing. It may be on a database. It may be on a what I call the old school database, a series of filing cabinets. Yeah. We may have a, a BMS system telling us everything's going on in a building. But the problems here 
is interoperability. What's going on? All these things are not necessarily talking to each other and they're causing us a bit of a difficulty. Now this is where BIM comes in because BIM is talking about an integrated process where there's that one truth of information. So how can we improve and how can we learn? So to ensure that these things are the same, what I what I tasked the, some of my students with was looking at the, the use of digital technologies and interoperable collaborative platforms. So looking at something such as Revisto and how we can use this to understand the information that we have. Um, so what I what I gave them is actually our this is our the picture of our building here, uh, the IQ building down in SA1 in Swansea. Uh, this is a fairly new facility within the, the last five years. Um, was uh, achieved uh, BIM level two maturity, um, but it was contractor uh, led. So the contractor wanted to do uh, BIM level two for obvious advantages during the construction and design process with little client involvement. Okay, the client obviously gave them the brief, but from a BIM perspective, they weren't actually telling the contractor and the design team what they needed to maintain and operate that building. So this was a challenge for the students. So we'll take some of this information that we have. So we had some architectural information, m and &E, structural, furniture fi uh, and fixtures. And we put all this information today uh, together in a, in a collaborative model using a mixture of native files and universal IFC files, okay? So some of these students had never used any um, modeling software, CAD software. Um, they hadn't used Revit, um, but they were able to put all this information to build quite a complex model. And what that model was able to do is it was to give us a feeling for what that what the building was potentially as designed and then to challenge to see if that was the building as constructed. So what the students were able to do then was take that information and write a report and each had a look at different elements of uh, using the software there where they could uh, look where things were clashing, where things weren't where they're supposed to be, to try and find information about this building rather than trawling through all the 2D information, the box files that um, the, uh, our, our colleagues in the facilities management had, but to use this data which was all contained on that uh, infamous uh, USB stick. So what they came up with then was um, uh, they found a lot of, uh, you know, the m &E systems weren't necessarily in the, in the correct locations. We had issues where uh, the bottom right one is quite, a, quite an interesting one, really. One of the students came out of where the, uh, the air volume calculations were, correct, were, were correctly assumed for this building because the volumes are jutting through the, the roof structure there. So when those volumes were used as the calculation for the air quality, were they actually using the volume of the space or were they using that overall volume, which is shown there, which protrudes through the building? So a number of issues are found there, and I, I, I can't obviously take you through the students' reports, but what that did is it, it actually raised a number of, of issues that, you know, we need to understand the buildings that we're, we're, we're using. And they made some recommendations in terms of areas on the building where we could put additional sustainability, such as, you know, there were opportunities for photovoltaics. Um, and there were opportunities as well to look at some minor alterations to perhaps put draft lobbies in, things like that, you know, where we hadn't necessarily uh, considered them uh, within the building. So I'm going to jump a little bit now and just say, well, that's all very well, okay, because we're dealing with a brand new building there and we have that information available to us. But, you know, coming from a position where I was working in local authority, part of a large client organization, a BIM project such as the new build may only be one or two per year, and you're dealing with, you know, perhaps 200 small scale projects. Okay, so what about existing building stock? Where does this leave us with that? So. What I asked uh, the students to look as they think about the challenges of decarbonization is a lo lovely little um, 
um, quotes on there, which you've probably read before I will read out. But if you think about the, the buildings that we're, you know, we have to decarbonize, the majority of them are already going to be there by, you know, the ones by 2050. Then obviously we need to think about how we do those kind of deep retrofits of the building. And we also have that kind of challenges of the different building typologies that we're dealing with. Yeah, so, you know, not all buildings are the same. We have some historic buildings. You know, we have uh, buildings which, um, which are changing pretty much all the time. And I can think of over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months, the way that we're working is differently. So, you know, we need to think about the flexibility to change, to change to those changing needs for buildings and how buildings can think and can learn and adapt. And then how these digital technologies can assist us in doing that. Okay, so those are a number of the things that you know, I've been researching with the students, but thinking about how we build and create that kind of data rich building stock. Now, I've taken something of, of Mike's work here in his previous uh, role at UWE, um, because it was, it was taken really as an exemplar and hopefully he'll show you some of those, um, uh, some of those models and, and the benefits of some of this thing through the software. But really what, what the focus is, is how we take that uh, information and we build that data rich building stock to enable us to manage these these buildings throughout their life cycle so as i said there's a limited time to upgrade existing buildings to deliver these kind of net zero targets that we've got so can bim help us evaluate our building stock to operate and maintain digital estates now again client is key here you know the client is key to unlocking the full potential of bim uh, and we need to work as, as client teams um, to deliver these things. And I say that as client teams because this is something that we are going to be doing at Trinity St. David's. What the uh, research that some of the master's students have been doing has kind of identified to our, to our own team in facilities management the need to, to fully understand um, a digital estate. And we have a number of buildings scattered all over the country um, but we have a variety of information available, 2D plans, some PDFs, we've got some USB sticks, but we need to understand the digital estate in order to address some of those challenges which are facing us within the industry. So I'm going to sum up there and just say I'm hopeful really that some of the things that I've talked about this morning, snapshot though it is, were you able to see that some of the benefits through BIM through the life cycle of assets. Okay, so I'm going to pass over to Mike now, and hopefully, Mike, that will be a nice little segue onto uh, what you're going to talk about. Thanks, Gavin. I don't think you could have done a better job. <laughs> <laughs> like, you've done this before. Great stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Gavin. That was really, uh, really insightful. So uh, great to see all that's getting fed through into um, into the academic stuff you're doing as well. So hopefully, we'll see some of that good stuff filter through into industry locally as well so thanks a lot mr ford great is is the screen share working first first question yes it is yeah great so, right five points for that over to you mike <laughs> right hello everyone um so without further ado uh, design construct operate and maintain so focusing really in on on the end of this uh segment here so let's see if i can change slides there we go um, so a little bit about Ridge. Um, Ridge is is where I'm working currently, and uh, we are an organisation of um, more than 600 people, 12 locations across the country, um, with 80% uh, repeat business. And what what I quite like about Ridge is it's a private partnership, so we can sort of do the long-term development um, uh, of things without without having to worry too much about you know shareholders and things like that so we, we can take a long longer term view um, so about me um, as I said previously and Reese said um, I've come from the the University of the West of England where I was the BIM manager within the estates team for eight eight years 
Um, at UE, we, we digitized almost the, the entire campus, um, some 350,000 square meters of buildings. And within that, we digitized processes as well so that we were actually using that digital information. Um, so one, one of my key passions is to try and get away from this. We keep talking about this USB stick, which gets delivered to clients at the end of the project. And everyone says, you know, that ends up in, in the drawer and no one looks at that information. And it's, it's great information. So I really, really want to see people making best use of that. Um, so I, I've moved over to, to Ridge. Um, I'm the digital engineering group manager. Uh, the, the joke I always make is my mum still has no idea what I do for a job. She didn't know what BIM manager meant. She's got no hope of digital engineering group manager. Um, I, I've been at Ridge for less less than three months. Um, and my job is, um, part of my job is to align our, our digital delivery to what clients need uh, to help clients take advantage of digital technologies. We've been talking to different different clients about how they can make better use of technology and the information handing over to them and looking at innovation within Ridge and uh, our systems and processes in-house. So I want to get straight into, you know, how what is the best way to, to manage information? And I think we've got a few different information streams on, on projects and in, in FM. So we, we've got models which are providing our graphical needs. So we've got drawings and, um, you, know, um, you know, geometry and things coming out of there. Then we've we've got we've still got files, so we've we've got reports, we've got uh, in in the FM space, we've got warranty information, we've got manufacturers literature for for things, and then we've also got this database need, so a need for structured data, structured information. Um, so uh, if we're talking from a client's point of view, that's often the CAFM system, so some some sort of database sat in the background, and. What I think is all of these things need to link together. We need to have a common data source. We need to have a single source of truth, a golden thread of information, right? So how these links will work. Um, so in terms of file storage, now this could be a CDE system, but uh, any cloud file storage system will, will do the job is we, we need to be able to link to documents through through models and through databases. So if we've got a piece of manufacturer's literature, we should be able to get to that through through a model if, and we should be able to get to that through a database. Uh, we should be able to push data from the model into, into the cloud storage. Um, so that, that might be some report on clashes, for example, that sort of thing. Um, we should be able to push information from, from a database to the cloud storage. So that, that again, might be uh, some sort of report. Um, and then the, the linking both ways from the cloud storage system and then from the model, we've got all of this asset information stored in here and we need to be able to sync that back to a database. We've got structured data that, for example, people who don't access the model can input um, things like that and, and, and link it to those documents as well. Um, so, so that's the kind of picture that there, there are other bits to this. So like we've, we've talked, uh, you know, briefly about sort of digital twins or the idea of having sensors and BMS information that, that that's another sphere that should link in, but I, I really want to sort of focus on, on these three areas in my presentation. So I think we need to think about data differently. So if we, again, Gavin, Gavin give that good, uh, graph in this last presentation about how technologies advance through time. Uh, but if we roll back, um, computers didn't used to have graphical operating systems. They used to have text-based operating systems, things like MS-DOS and uh, other, other non-Microsoft systems are obviously available as well. Uh, but that moved on to, to, to having a, a graphical user interface, G GUI. Uh, this has opened up computing technology to many, many more people than would have been able to interact through it through, through DOS. Mm -hmm. and I. I think we've got a, a similar situation now with databases and models. Databases are really great ways of structuring data, but they don't they don't mean so much to us as humans. So if if I want to find out some information on on a, a particular door within a building, like going in and finding that in a database and knowing that that's the right door that I'm clicking on and accessing that data, that doesn't doesn't mean a lot to me as a human being. What, what I interact with day to day is buildings and buildings that look like buildings, which is the great thing about the model. And what we can do with the model is go and click on things and find out that background information. And I think that's a really, really powerful way to, to interact with the building's information. So what I'm going to mostly do in this presentation is a live demo of, of a model and 
how, how you can different ways of accessing information. So if I just zoom out a little bit here, um, this is a model that we put together from 2D information for, for a housing client at Ridge. Uh, and we did this just to demo to them how they could be using their information better. So this, this building's just got an external and it's got one floor model, modeled on the inside. But uh, for, for the demonstration purposes today, this, this will do the job. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come walk in through the front door of the building. I'm using Revitso for this, by the way, which please reese greatly. Uh, <laughs> I just <laughs> come around here. I click on, click on an asset here, so I've got a door. And here, I, straight away, I can start viewing its properties. Now, we've only loaded in some some low-level information here for the purposes of a demo, but straight away you can see we've got we've got this thing's fire rating. Uh, we've got a bit of information about its size. It's got a a uniclass uh, categorization. So the categorization of things is really important with with all of this. So. Um, the main thing we need to do is know what we've got in, in building. So categorization and achieves that. And then if we come down here, what we've also got is, is a hyperlink. Um, so this is what I mean about this. Uh, I'm just going to click on that, load it up. And hopefully do, 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 we've got a link in here to, to a SharePoint site. And the, there are loads of different products on the market that do this, uh, this kind of linking. Uh, but we've got the the fire report for which includes the information about that door from there as a demo. So in in terms of how I want to view information and how I want to access documents through building items, this this is all a very good workflow. Um, the other things I'd like to demonstrate is how that two D graphical information is is linked to that three D information. So th this is really important because we're talking about having a golden thread of information for a building. And what clients commonly do is they, they almost don't realize how important the graphical information is within their systems. Um, so, for example, clients might have like university clients might have a wayfinding system for students to find their way around buildings. Uh, there are often lots of other systems like fire alarm, Wi-Fi, um, access control, security, intruder systems. Lots of these things will have graphical interfaces. And when we start to talk about a golden thread of information, the graphics in this model kind of need to tie in with those different systems if, if it's all going to work together. If I'm going to move uh, a fire detector in this this model and have that update on my fire system, um, we, we need that kind of interoperability. Now, I don't think anyone's entirely solved that, but um, this, this sort of demonstrates quite nicely how the 2D and the 3D information link together. And I can click on a button here and and this Revitso software will overlay my, my plan directly onto onto my model in in the place that, that cut through has been taken. Um, so so that that's quite important. But what we can also demonstrate here is uh, if I want to go and look around a, a room. So uh, lots of lots of clients aren't aren't you know that happy about maybe interacting with 3D information and they, they prefer looking at 2D plans. And I think what's good about this is it's, it's fine to do that. Um, I can just click in this room. That cut I put on still earlier is still there, so I can take that back off uh, and, and, and pan around it. And I haven't really had to navigate a, two, a 3D model at all. All I need to do is stand in the space and, and pan around and I can look at things and I can I can click on things and I can access their information. So that, that sort of lowers the barrier to entry into doing something like this. Um, uh, and then the ne next thing is, is sort of around commenting. So you can see these sort of bubbles here. The, these are different um, uh, different comments, if you like, different, um, so these, these have got different purposes. So um, I've got some of these which are photographs. So there's a bathroom here, I can click on that and I can get through to uh, access to a, a three, 360 degree photograph. They're not the same bathroom. I, I didn't have a photo of the client's bathroom, so this this is my bathroom. Nice <laughs> but, bathroom. But it, but, <laughs> yeah, it, it it makes a point quite nicely that we 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 can use this as a as, as a user interface. Also, uh, I took a few images from their fire report, and I, I've stuck those on doors as well. That 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 was the testing of the doors. A little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, <laughs> view into that and th and then I, I've made a few which are about conditions so we can have uh, conditions so we, we could be doing a condition survey of this building saying door jamming and we can 
in you, you know we can add that extra layer of context about you know what's going wrong in the building what the condition of different things we can sort of start layering all of that up onto our, our graphical information which is a really really good way of of interacting with 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 data the other thing that i wanted to demonstrate here is we've made a fire plan of the building and again it, it, we didn't have their information so this this is all sort of mocked up and fake but what, what we've set to do is no, no one's come in and, and color coded these walls. What we've done is we've given each wall data, which says I'm a 30 minute wall, I'm a 60 minute wall. There's a there's a bit of a key there. Uh, and then then we've told the software to color code it by by fire rating ra rather than uh, having to manually color. And what that's done is it's maintained that golden thread of information between the the data there and the color coding. So if someone changes the data, the color coding changes. That's that's really important. And then because we had all of that information in, in the 3D model, what I'm going to do is um, we've set up for them just uh, we can go and say select all of the fire doors in the model. And we just need to make the model a bit transparent so we can see those. That hasn't applied. Let's click on it again. There we go. So now, now it's selected all of the things that are fire doors. And in the back of that, uh, if I can bring that up, there's a, just a little bit log of logic that's saying where where a parameter in Revit is set to 30 minutes or 60 minutes, then include them in this selection, basically. Um, so that's that's how we're selecting the fire doors. Again, using that same information that we use to color the fire plans. Um, but the nice thing about this is we might want to make a PPM for those fire doors. So what we can do is come in and we can apply uh, a stamp to assign to someone to go and check all of the fire doors. So create eight stamps. And now I can click on these and I can I can go on site. I could take a photograph. I could attach the photograph. I could say this one's fine and have this have this come up on a report. When when I do an export later on, so is 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 a good way of managing all, all of that information in in one one place essentially um which is the main thing i, I wanted to demonstrate today um i'm just trying to think if there's anything else i need to show i don't i don't think there is um so so plans linked to models and comments and things linked to that all in one place all kind of you know color coded and um looking great great way of interacting and i'm just going to show you what you know th this was quite a basic model i'm going to open one of my my old models from yui and show you a little bit more what um you know a detailed construction model can look like it, it hand over and, and just think how useful this information is um how how often you you lose information um in in databases or you know lose information in those filing cabinets that that Gavin showed on his slide earlier. Um, so if I just zoom in here, we should find we've got lots and lots more information in a model like this. So we've got here uh, like a PIR or something as we come in and we just click on that. And you can see it's got, you know, it's got life expectancy data, it's got replacement cost data. Um, it's been classified with the product code and the system code, so we know exactly what that thing is. It's a dome camera, not a, not a PIR. It's got links to things. It's got the date it was installed, when its warranty starts. Um, it's part of a security information set, and we can see there it's got a unique identifier as well. So lots of lots and lots of really good data, and we've got lots of contextual ways of viewing this as well. So not not just the 2D plans, but we can also add cuts and sections and and things like that as well. Uh, let's do that as a plane and cut against that wall. I can just move that back. Move that back, not forward. There we go. So you can see in like there's a big atrium space in the middle of this building. Probably my cut's not in the perfect place for that. Just Zoom out a little bit more. So there's there's a big atrium space here. If if you had like a maintenance request or something to maintain something at high level here, we can quickly take a dimension in here. We can understand how high above the ceiling that uh, that asset is, and do things like bring appropriate um, access equipment to site when we come to do maintenance and things like that. So that that's uh, 
that's that's really how I see models acting as a, a graphical user interface for for information. Let me just go back to my presentation. Only one more more slide for me, guys. So I just want to finish on um, some of the things that that Ridge are doing, the ways that that we can help if if you're a client. So um, first of all, like we're we're looking quite seriously into digital twins. So this is where we we bring in that extra layer of sensor and contextual uh, data. Um, Ridge have employed a genius that works somewhere up in the in the Manchester office, and uh, he, he's really kind of enabled us to, you know develop quite a, a really cost effective platform for using digital um, uh, sensor data and things within uh, within models and we're, we're setting up a, a living lab in our in our Oxford office so um, that that's been of interest starting to become of interest to clients to, to build these digital twins uh, we can do scan to bim ridge have got a, a geo team they, they've done some some fantastic work. The team that I'm part of um, focuses around sort of digital project delivery, so um, doing these clash reports, checking of data and information, IFCs, um, things like that. Um, before I started at Ridge, I saw um, uh, a presentation two of my colleagues had done on fire compliance, and I, just from from my my university perspective at that point in time, that was it was just an absolutely amazing piece of work. Um, so, so what they've been able to do, and, and I'm, I'm kind of coming from it from, I'm interested in this green square here, which is the, uh, the, the thing filling the builder's work hole, uh, because you can then schedule, um, you can sh basically, you know what that material is, so you can uh, ensure that you're, you're compliant. Uh, the university had a lot of problems not knowing what, what that material was and, you know, if their buildings are, are compliant and things like that. So having that saved in a model and having that, you know, this is the fire stopping material is great, but the the clever bit behind that is that during a project, they they can tell you how how big the builder's work hold needs to be, uh, depending on the fire stopping material. They can tell you how far away from the edge the different pipes need to be, depending on what material they're made of. All these automated checking tools, which I just thought were were amazing. And then and finally, some of the things we're trying to work on with um, like uh, the the housing client I showed the demo of earlier is thinking about how they structure information uh, within the database, how, how they can get the right information out um, to do what they need to do to make sure they're compliant, to make sure their tenants are happy, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and we can build all of this together into one integrated environment, which I think is, is, a, is a really powerful thing. Um, so I will end there. Are we, are we going to questions next, Reese? Yeah, that's, that's great, Mike. So thank you very much for that detailed overview i think you covered quite a lot there in, uh, in in the short amount of time that we we give you so um really yeah. appreciate you rattling all of that through but made perfect sense really clear and i think lots of benefit from what you and gavin have demonstrated so again thank you both for for sharing those really interesting use cases and great to see benefits from a client perspective i think based on our the feedback we had from the last session gerald right was we need to hear more from clients. You know, we want to understand what it is our clients need and want. Um, so, you know, talking of that USB stick um, that, that's never used in in operation, um, it's great to see that actually it is and demonstrated to from a client's perspective all of that additional value that can be added during the operational phase. Phase, which, I mean. Gavin, Mike, I mean, what, what's the typical life cycle of uh, the buildings you're involved in uh, sort of versus design and construction? I remember you giving me some some stats, Gavin, is it like two years in design, three or four in construction, and then 30 in operation? Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 you could. It, it depends. And I think that the challenge is the different building typologies, really, that we're dealing with as well. Um, that obviously, you know, the, the, it's a bit of a no-brainer for the kind of new build, you know, um, but in order to get the right information to manage your building, you need to be asking the right questions at the start. And that's always the, the challenge, particularly from a client's perspective, because um, if you're a designer or you're a consultant or, um, or a contractor, um, you're going to say, well, what, what do you want? Now, for large organizations, that client is more than one person. And there, there is the complexity and that's the difficulty. And that's why some of the stuff that Mike did previously in his previous role at, at UE is, is so exemplar, really, that um, 
managed to get everybody around the table and and, and kind of and push everyone in the right direction in terms of uh, creating digital estates. Thanks, Gavin. Well, I'll hand over to you now, Gerald. I can see the questions are coming through thick and fast, so plenty to, <laughs> to get through. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Bob. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, um, Rhys. Before I move to the Q&A session, I wanted to thank the speakers, obviously yourself, Rhys, Mike and Gavin for their valuable inputs. Very powerful presentations, I have to say. Um, I also like to thank um, our partners, UK BIM Alliance Wales and the Construction Wales Innovation Centre. Thanks also uh, to Vicky for managing the um, event. Now it's time to ask questions and open up to the virtual floor. Um, but kindly ask you introduce yourself, who you work for, and who the question is directed at. Um, um, please. Um, there are a few questions which have come through um, chat, um, and I'll read those out. Um, the first one comes from Mohammed. Um, what is your approach for creating a structured data, e.g., stakeholders engagement? Is that something, Gavin? You're happy to answer. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, that's a very good question, actually. I think in terms of stakeholder engagement, it's getting the right people around the table. OK, <clears throat> and I think that is always going to be um, the difficulty. When I was um, in my previous role at the local authority, you know, I, I'm an architect. I don't I don't maintain these buildings. I'm not from the, the uh, facilities management team. Um, I'm not necessarily the budget holder either. But I was asked, um, you know, what do you want to manage this building? Because I was a consultant contact. You're asking the wrong people the wrong questions. But I think it, it, it's almost like going to, your, to, to the facilities team and, and splitting it back down to, you know, what are the things you're really interested in in terms of buildings? OK, so what are the key things that, that, that you need? What's the key information that you need in order to maintain your building? You've got your, your cyclical testing, so you want to know information about that. You probably want to know stuff about your boilers. You want to know about all those those systems that you need to connect to. But I think what well, you know, there's there's a shift uh, change really um, coming from the kind of the, as I said, the old school format of doing things and, and into that kind of digital age. So I think you've got to be mindful of that when you're when you're asking these questions and start small. Now the benefit of of doing BIM processes is that wherever you you end with that project so it becomes the asset for the client you feed that back into the next one but that's not just for the consultant or the contractor that's for the client as well so you can go back and say well evaluate do i have the information that i need to manage this and what would i change next time and think of it that way and it's always going to be the bill you're never going to get it right first time you're never going to get it right first time so i think it's that engagement but it's all about the right people around the table as well Thank you, uh, Gavin. And um, I don't know, Mike, did you want to add anything to that? Or? Uh, in terms of data structure, um, during my time at the university, we, we had a CAFM system and that really dictated the, the structure of information. It, it wasn't it wasn't really the best. It didn't really meet all users needs. Um, so I think as as we progressed, we started to think more about, you know, can we hold some of this data in the model and interact with it through tools like Revitso? Um, since my time at Ridge, um, we we think much more about sort of industry standards, so things like the IFC data structure, um, and can can that be used, in, you know, as a, as a basis for for the information that we're trying to to collect and manage. Um, so yeah, uh, whereas at UE, I didn't really have much insight into IFC, so that that's been quite an interesting learning curve. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, um, Mike. I have another um, question here from from Anthony, uh, Anthony Brophy. Um, do you capture and audit procured product data against the original specification data? Checking value engineering outcomes is becoming more and more important. Mike, do you want to have a go at that? I, I agree with you, Anthony. That, that would be an excellent uh, check to do. Uh, <laughs> The university didn't do it, and I haven't had any exposure to, to, to you know, well, I, I guess Ridge wouldn't be so much involved in that part of the process. But um, no, I, I think that that is an excellent thing to do. Yeah, and Anthony's actually part of the the BIM Alliance Wales team as well. So yeah, thanks yeah. for tripping in, Anthony. Yeah, great, great question and uh, good, good comments. I think. 
I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we've um, Anthony is um, a follow up here. In my experience, there is a lack of knowledge about the statutory requirements for maintenance, which impacts asking the right questions. Yeah, I think we yep. can all agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you, um, Anthony. But um, um, a couple of very nice um, uh, comments about um, excellent presentations, um, which um, um, are worthy of, of, of note there. Um, at this point, it might be worth um, opening up to the floor and I can believe. Yeah, let me do that. I can't see any hands up. Any questions from the floor? As people will need to switch off their, their mic if um, they do want to ask. Um, we do ask you all, don't be shy. But please, uh, please share your thoughts, questions, <clears throat> comments. We, we love to hear them. I, on, uh, I, I have a question, um, if, if, if I may, uh, and this is aimed at um, uh, Mike. Uh, sorry to be picking on you, Mike. <laughs> um, <laughs> <You're used> but, <laughs> <laughs> following the the Grenville disaster, there's a push, and you mentioned uh, golden threads of information, so this is not completely new to you, obviously. Um, following the Grenville disaster, there's a push for all project information, so-called golden thread of information, to be digitised. Um, what, if any, are the implications for clients moving forward? Well, I, I think for clients moving forward, they, they uh, depending on what comes out of the building safety bill, um, there may well be additional requirements to, uh, you know, for future projects to be digital, to be BIM. I don't know what it's going to say about uh, retrospective uh, for existing buildings, but I, I, I think there's quite a clear guide that for, for high rise, especially, <laughs> There's mm -hmm. going to be that need for that digital tw that digital um, golden thread of information um, from from a safety point of view, and I think it's it's kind of a key time now. I think for clients to be looking at BIM, looking at what it can offer, uh, trying trying to get ahead of that. So it's not going to be like a you know a massive retrospective rush to look at projects that are on board, to look at past buildings at, at the point in time that it becomes legislated. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my take on it. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Mike, for that. Anybody else got any questions they would like to ask? Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, I can see your hand up, Stephen. Yep, but you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Oh, you've muted yourself again, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, we, we can see your mouth going, but can't hear anything coming out. So it's all good. Stuff. Go. Just, there yeah. we go. Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you, Stephen. Right. It, it very much follows on on a, the question you've just 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 uh, asked, really. But it's really addressed to Mike. Um, I work for a large housing provider. Mike, are you seeing more interest from, from housing providers now because of the building safety bill? And are you seeing housing providers starting to embrace BIM technologies rather than it's usually been left to uh, the larger developers and, uh, and non-housing? Um, I'm, I'm really concerned there's going to be a mad rush over the next nine months of, for housing providers to try and get uh, more of, of your time trying to sort out BIM. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I've, in, I've only been at Ridge for under three months now, but since I've been here, um, I've, I've given, I've done two pieces of work for, for housing um, around BIM. Uh, so from from what I'm seeing on this end, it looks like it's definitely something that's that, that's heating up. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, You're on mute now, Gerald. <laughs> oh, it, it was my turn. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think something coming from um, Anthony. I'm, I'm getting technology issues now because um, there's a software download taking place as we, as I speak. We can um, hear you okay. Yeah. I'm going to shout out a question of, if I can, Gerald, to, to our yes, presenter. Yes, please, please, please go so, ahead. Everything you've shown, gents, has been, been fantastic. I was just curious, you know, I'm following up from our last call. What, what's been 
from an owner's perspective, the, the biggest challenge for you to embrace these digital tools to better aid in the operation and maintenance phase? Is there something that industry needs to do or is it delivery of information from the consultants and tr contractors you employ? Uh, you know, what, what's the biggest challenge in that area? And we will put, put that up to, to Gavin first. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a change in, in mindset for a start. I think sometimes from a client perspective, um, and I see that as a client group perspective, um, you assume that the building is brand new, therefore nothing's going to go wrong. Uh, so if we're dealing with new builds, um, and really I think everyone's challenged with resources, um, and it's the whole firefighting. If you if you're managing a large estate then you've got to deal with all the kind of the day to day issues. And then if you have a brand new project come in, which is, say, you know, BIM level two maturity, you don't expect anything to go wrong with that building. But you've got to know that you've got the right information as well. You've got to know how that building operates and maintains. Um, and, you know, that, that's been some of the challenges that we've had down at, down at um, Trinity as well. You know, we've got a new building that we're trying to understand. Um, and that's why we're looking to to push on and kind of digital digitize the estates. Um, you know, we've done it through the through the benefit of using the students to do that an element of research. Then, but what that has done is that information has been shared with our team um, in the facilities management, and they 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 said this is this is great. You know, we should be doing this. Um, we have not fully understanding. The information that was provided to them. Not to say that everything that was provided to them was exactly correct. You know, because they, you know, those questions probably weren't answered, uh, asked at the outset. But um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a challenge of mindsets. Um, I think that the question of the, the safety bill is quite interesting. You know, I think there will be a push um, to. I think uh, governments, particularly Welsh government, will have um, uh, an indication that you know new bills are going to be. You'll have a digital model of it with all the information there, and you're going to be managing it in a certain way. Um, whether that is or isn't the case. So I think it's certainly something which we need to uh, start adopting. Perfect. If you wanted to add anything else to that, Mike? Yeah, I, I think as an industry, we've had quite a long way to go. We've been quite slow uh, historically in embracing, embracing technologies and new ways of working. Um, we, we've we've had historic problems, uh, you know, being quite litigious, so um, and 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 not always working collaboratively. Um, and I think that's definitely improved from my time in the industry. Um, but in terms of like thinking about how information hands over from from designer to contractor to client, I, I think we need to we need to get better at that, and we need to be better at understanding what what clients do with information. And clients need to be better at specifying information and understanding how they're going to use the information and, and not just rely on putting things in filing cabinets and putting USB sticks in drawers. Mm. Oh, good point. Uh, I've just shared um, our details now. So as, as a closing point from me before I hand over to Gerald to close out is if, if you have, you know, stories that you'd like to share with community as well, then this is a great platform to do that. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So drop Gerald and myself an email and we'll discuss how we can get you involved in, in one of our future events. So well, thank you from me again to, to our speakers and for everyone for, for joining. And uh, I'll hand back across to you, Gerald, to wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Rhys. Um, yes, on behalf of the CIOB, um, uh, again, thanks, uh, Rhys, Mike and, and Gavin, uh, and all the participants um, that uh, joined us um, today. I wish you the um, rest of a good day. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.